Okay, is this on? Fantastic. Right. Okay, so uh, welcome to this talk on uh, what's, what's called revolu revolutionizing content consumption. Now that's an interesting title because I thought the point of NFTs, the promise of them, was to drive some sort of shift from passive consumption to active participation. I was wondering if you guys have any thoughts on that. Josie, do you want to lead? Yeah, no, I was going to say it was a funny title because we've gone from consumption to ownership, um, which is really, really powerful, and it's become observer to participant, and that's a really special thing about NFTs is that it really provides this sense, this, this shift in um, mentality where you're a part of something, um, you own something, and you get rewarded for that in many cases. So it's an interesting title. We might have to change it up on stage. <laughs> Tweak it. Yeah, no, I, I definitely have some thoughts on this. Um, you know, with, with NFT Now, we actually just announced the Now Pass uh, yesterday here on this stage, and the whole idea is rethinking the media model, which, you know, Web2 Media, we believe Web2 Media is broken. Uh, in the Web2 Media model, you built audience as a means to an end to indirectly monetize as a middleman for brands, whereas in Web3, you can actually build community as an end in itself and directly monetize by sharing in the value that you create. And like we see it, especially with the when you think about legacy media, like the Web2 media model led to uh, a lack of trust. It led to misaligned incentives. It led to this clickbait race to the bottom, and it, and people were maximizing audience scale instead of instead of community depth. Um, and that's that's something we want to fix, and that's something that we're trying to build at NFT Now. So the the, go, the idea of like going from consumption to participation is actually really critical to to everything that we're building. But that's also a challenge if you're working with established IP because it must be quite hard for you know very established brands like like Warner Brothers, like the people that you're working with, to uh, to actually let go of some of that control that they have over the properties. How do you well, deal ask, with Well, let that? Josh answer that yeah. question first. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, coming from the, I guess, traditional studio side, I think we've been evolving how we approach stories and content in general. I think what Web3 does is it just gives us a catalyst to try more things. You know, we're... Social started that, you know, it's a it's a two-way conversation. I think Web3 becomes less of a conversation about story and more of a conversation about the future of the franchises, uh, and that's exciting. Um, we don't know where it's going to go. <laughs> and, you know, I would add to that by saying, look, when my goal at, as the CEO of Orange Comet is to embrace the Web3 current enthusiasts, but to take these heritage big IP, like what we did with The Walking Dead, and Josh has a million amazing titles over at Warner Brothers, but to find a whole group of fans in the world that are already attached to these properties, but bring them into Web3. And, and I think the conduit of using massive IP can ease them in in a much better way, make them feel a bit more comfortable. And that's not to say, by the way, I mean, we're an amazing fans of all the original projects that, that take place. This is a creator community, and I, as a TV and film producer for 25 years, that's how I got into this space. But, but there is an opportunity here to, um, I guess, embrace the enthusiasts now in a great way, but allow others to come in with these properties. I mean, do you, do you think that the, uh, the breakthrough is going to come from established IP, or is it going to come from a creator-owned project or a Web3 native project? I, I'm, go ahead, Josie. Well, I think it's definitely going to be a mix. I mean, right now we look, right now it's, it's Web3 all the way. I mean, you look at the top projects, it's all brands that have come out of Web3. Um, obviously, Yuga, Doodles, Azuki, Artifact, all of these people, right? The top brands are from our space. I would love to get proven wrong by Web2 and see, not proven wrong, but I would love to be surprised by Web2 and see that happen because I do think it will help bring in the masses. Yeah. I don't think it's happened yet. And I'll just give a stat to that. You know, on the Walking Dead project, which we launched last year, which um, has done extremely well, um, and it's leading to a big Web3 game, which we're going to beta test next month for everybody. But about, and these are not exact scientific stats, but Josh, I'm sure, has some really good experience with this too. Roughly 75% of our project for The Walking Dead was coming in from people who had never seen an episode of the show before, of the series, which was on 11 seasons, but were loving what we were doing with it and thought the work was sick and elevated and all that. But the better stat, to Josie's part, point here, is that, again, roughly 25% of the fans coming into the project never bought an NFT, ever. 
And and that's exciting because the property could like that and what Josh has with Batman and so many other amazing pro uh, IP can bring an audience in. And and I w I agree it will be a blend. Yeah, I think uh, I think the power of Web three is the fact that the four of us are on the same panel because uh, Web two that probably wouldn't have happened. It's not you didn't have this merging of or I guess knowledge sharing between uh, uh, creators and big giant studios. And I think. I don't know where the next kind of big breakthrough is going to come from. I think we're building on each other, um, and you know, I, it's fun and it's exciting to see. I mean, to the point you raised earlier, Josie, why do you think that uh, a legacy IP has yet to cut through in the Web3 space in the same way that something like Bored Apes has or, or, or CryptoPunks? Um, we're still in the counterculture phase. We are still very, very early. I think there's a lot of um, uncertainty uh, from the traditional you know, IPs. Um, there's also a lot of education that still needs to happen in those IPs themselves, but also in their market and with their fan base. Um, the NFT space is brand new still, which means that they're, um, it's, it's not a safe environment for a lot of people that maybe are not savvy yet. Um, so I think there's a room for the NFT space to grow as a whole still. We're still very early and there's room for um, these traditional IPs to really learn about what is a new way to um, broaden their audience and have people really participate rather than just observe? I want Matt to answer it and I want to just Sure, I, I would just say never bet against medium native culture. You know, like we, as we watch, like as, as new mediums have, have emerged, it, it, you know, the, the, when photography came out, it's not like the best painters necessarily became the best photographers. When, when moving pictures came out, not the best photographers didn't become the best directors and movie makers. Like this is a new medium. It takes, an, uh, it's a new way of thinking creatively and, and medium native culture will always rise to the top. And I think that's what we're seeing right now. And there's that authenticity that comes from being part of this space, from starting in this space and from em embracing the ethos uh, that, that'll like, accompany this movement. I couldn't agree more. You know, we did the Anthony Hopkins project. Um, you know, Anthony called us up after seeing our work. Um, we had a tremendous success with him. But to Matt's point, uh, here's an 85-year-old iconic legendary actor. But uh, who, not the poster child of Web3. I think we would all agree with that. Um, but first of all, he was unbelievably enthusiastic about getting into Web3. Second of all, he made the very first movie in the space called Zero Contact. So it was the very first NFT movie. And thirdly, and most importantly with what Matt was saying, he was, he's an artist besides being an actor. His artwork sells for hundreds of thousands of dollars. So he was genuinely and enthusiastically a creator and genuinely and enthusiastically somebody who wanted to learn about Web3. And when he put it out there, which is what the critical part was for us because, again, you don't want somebody, especially when you're working with traditional IP, you don't want to drag them into this space. It's, it, it's, a, bad, it's a bad look. But um, he was genuinely enthusiastic about it. When he put it out there, people like Beeple reached out to him um, because he said, I want to learn about NFTs. I want to learn about Web3. And he was genuine about it, and that's what we – jumped on and were able to you know, have a, a tremendous success. And again, to, to this panel's point, um, peop, some of that came from uh, traders and flippers and people who just thought the project was great, and others, a percentage came from just genuine Anthony Hopkins fans who were looking to become part of a project that he was involved in. Yeah, I, I, I also think, to probably build on Josie's point a little bit, big brands aren't known for being especially nimble. And uh, this in Web3 is something where you have to pivot on a dime and, and really follow the, the, the fans and the uh, creators. And you know we have a billion Batman fans around the world and uh, we have to surprise and delight all of them and we try to. And uh, there's a big gap in education in what Web3 can bring. And you know we continuously try to find that, that benefit that Web3 can bring that Web2 can't. And you mentioned um, just now that it's a sort of very fervid space like there's a, there's a lot of development and change happening in a very compressed space of time i mean how have since you guys got into the space how have you seen the use of nfts in creating entertainment content evolve and where do you think it's going next there's lots of waves of it i mean 
my first experience with NFTs is when CryptoKitties launched in 2017 and we were breeding cats. We were like at our dinner table, sending cats back and forth to each other, waiting for their cool down time and mating them and then like sending them back. So it's really cool that NFTs have infinite design space. Um, they are programmable, which is an amazing thing about this. They can be an art piece one day, they can be membership to something another day, they can get you in access to a specific club or event the other day. Um, they're programmable. They can you can take your own meaning and put them on certain NFTs. They can change with the moon cycles or where you are in the world. Um, it's a really unique thing that the technology, we, we haven't even scratched the surface with it, in my opinion. Um, and we're going to continue to see NFTs evolve because of this infinite design space that we have. Go back. I mean, one of the uh, you know one of the reasons why I know we're still early is that a lot of people still think about NFTs as a category as opposed to a new medium that transcends all categories, and so and like lumping a lot of these projects and different things under one under one label um, really reduces I think like an understanding of the different creative and consumer priorities that are at play in each of these different use cases. Like we think about you know some of the use cases that that drove the the bull run, uh, digital art, digital collectibles. Sure, like. You know, those th those are very different from you know the the uh, the creative and credit cre creative and consumer priorities at play in like membership passes and you know a and uh, and and future use cases like literary NFTs, TV film, like more mundane uses of the blockchain, like government documents, t deeds to houses and cars, and all of these things. And so like that that really excites me because I think as as Josie said, we have only scratched the surface of the potential use cases of this technology. And once I think we reach a better, a more mature state will understand that, like you, sh like people shouldn't expect the same things out of each of these different use cases. And I'll I, I'll, I'll, sorry, Jesse, I would say I, I'll tell you the way I think it's evolving in an exciting way is that I, I deal with all the studios in town, you know, in in in, in Hollywood, um, and maybe last year Josh was the only Josh, but now there's a, almost a Josh at every place that's popping up. I'm still um, the only Josh. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. The, the OG Josh. The OG Josh. But that's exciting. That means that studios and networks are looking at this space and embracing this space and bringing in specialists like Josh to oversee this, which is so cool because, you know, they, they don't know it, by the way. We, we all, I, I mean, I speak for myself. I mean, I've been learning the last two and a half years. I'm learning every, every second of my life in this space, and it's exciting. You know, I went from making traditional television and movies. It, I filmed the Jennifer Lopez um, documentary. Um, this took me four years to make that film that we just released last year, four years. And now in this space, things are moving so fast and it's, and it's such a blazing speed, which is so exciting for all of us. But it's great to see that, um, that I guess general media and, and big entertainment properties are embracing uh, this in such a great way because they're finding specialists who are dedicated to figuring this out. Josie, you were about to weigh in there. Oh, I just wanted to say one quick thing that I think like illuminates of still how early we are. In 2017 is when I started creating crypto art. In 2017, 2018, and 2019, artists couldn't give away NFTs for free. Nobody wanted art NFTs. They wanted blockchain gaming and virtual land, and that's it. And the first NFT NYC, I had a little table sitting there with my art up on there, and it was really cool, but there was no other art there. It was literally NF an NFT conference, no art. It was, it was gaming and virtual land. So those three years were just surrounded by that, and now look how we, far we've come in the past three. So it really is just so brand new. And well, I'll, I'll wait to say the other part for I'm sure you have other questions about I you made me think of something of when you said your your movie took four years to make and I have some thoughts about the, cool. the speed of, of things now too. Okay. But yeah, yeah uh, just closing out that topic, I think, and I think those others that are at big brands can probably relate to this. The nice thing about um, 
if you want to do a retrospective of, of how it's changed is you can check your monthly updates to management <laughs> on the state of the <laughs> state of the uh, industry and you know what started off with the people sale you know back in you know early 2021 and what what we might have been focusing on then versus you know all through the evolution you know from PFPs to fan engagement to you know loyalty all of that kind of stuff and and so that's been actually really exciting is it seems like a new use case pops up and is pitched to us, frankly, every you know every week, and uh, and that's fun to watch. And, and I just want to say to to anyone on Josh's point out here that if you're a creator, an artist, you know somebody who has got a passion for Web three, which is obviously why I think we're all here. Uh, you know that's an open invitation into you know a studio that is looking for fresh ideas, not just from someone like myself and traditional, who came from traditional Hollywood, but that's the exciting part, is that the opportunity for all of us to do something cool, you know, how hard it would be for anyone in this room to just knock on a, a door to try and sell a television show or a movie. It's very, very tough, almost impossible, I would say, but not the case with what we got going on here in Web3, the opportunity for any creator in this room to do something at a high level is, is out there, and that's exciting. Jesse, you mentioned a few years ago artists couldn't give NFTs away. Now, I know, uh, Dave, we were talking earlier about the pricing of NFTs and whether it's entirely healthy that, you know, NFTs sell for millions of dollars. You know, for, for, for the purposes of, you know, content creation, consumption, entertainment, do we need to move towards, like, commoditized pricing for NFTs, do you think? I mean, I'll, I'll jump in from the entertainment side. I think, you know, we have fans... Uh, and sorry to keep using Batman as an example, but you know we have we have Batman fans that are casual fans that like to watch the movies, and we have a Batman fan that would buy a one of one Batmobile if they could, right? And that's how we approach uh, NFTs as digital collectibles. Is there's there's really a market for every type of fan, and and we try to find that. I think our main goal though is to bring the masses in, and with that you have to either give them away or uh, to bring them into the ecosystem or price them at a at uh, kind of a, a more appropriate point? Uh, look, for me, I mean, this might be shocking for people in this room. I, I don't like the um, speculative nature of NFTs. I, I, I feel like that's the early part for me. I think when people understand the value and the community and the utility and the content that's being created around the NFTs themselves, then, then I think we're at the next stage of NFTs and Web3. And so, you know, I, I would like to see, personally, I would like to see the flipping, you know, become something that just feels small in scale compared to people who are in this space because they love what Josie's doing or they love the stuff that Josh has or they love the stuff that Orange Comet's putting out and they want to be engaged in, a, in, a, in an exciting new way. Matt, I think you need to repeat what you said earlier about the NFTs being, I mean, NFTs are going to, there's going to be things that sell for millions of dollars and yep. things that are free. It, totally. It's not a, yeah. Yeah, it's not a one size fits all, right? And, and I think that that's really critical. It's, you know, like, when we think about it, like, we founded NFT Now with the mission of empowering the creators of culture and bringing this technology from niche to mainstream. And I think that, that one of the, the things that's, that's really important is understanding that, uh, you know, when you think about, for example, like a luxury good and the like, yeah, there's like the couture, there's the stuff that's really uh, far out of reach, but then there's also like the, the handbags and the wristwatch and, you know, and the, uh, and the accessories and the like. There's a way to, to participate for people in, in different markets. And I think what, one other thing as we're thinking about is that there are just different consumer priorities at play across all these different parts of the NFT market. The people who are flipping PFPs are, are you know, in Web2 would be in casinos. They would not be in Sotheby's. Like, like collecting art, right? Like, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. We just shouldn't have that drive the entire narrative. And as these markets mature, as we, as like, as we start to understand this, it'll fall into its own place. Right now, because we're so early, it's all under one category. It's all under one thing. It drives the narrative, and it underserves, I think, a lot of like the great work that is get being done and the more sustainable building blocks that are being built by some of the like the leading builders in the space. One of the other aspects of, of NFT entertainment that we've seen in sort of recent weeks, months, is the idea of giving um, members of the community a creative stake in projects. How does that, uh, how do you see that working and how do you see that evolving over the next few years? 
I think there are a lot of levels of that. Um, in our project, Cyber Brokers, we have already levels that are people specifically that are passionate about writing in our writer's room, helping us write canon that's actually like changing the story and everything like that. We have people that aren't writers and just wanna put their characters up for an audition, a broker audition, and just get written in the story. Um, we have people that wanna be extremely active that are creating their own characters books, uh, animations, all based off their character because they have those rights. Um, so it really depends on how the users want to participate and the people who want to be passive or be active, there's sort of a place for all of them, at least within Cyber Brokers and I think within a lot of others as well. Yeah, we're, we're easing into it, which is surprising to hear for a big studio, but um, we have a project uh, around Batman. I know that's shocking, but we have a project around Batman where our community is voting on the creation of a DC comic. We've never done this before, uh, where, you know, again, we're easing into it, so we're, we're giving uh, options, kind of like a choose-your-own-adventure, but there's like 40 votes that the community takes. And it's not pre-baked. Like I can say, this comic was not written before, and we're just presenting things we wanted. It was, uh, you know, whole things from which villains we're going to feature to which Batmobile to, you know, what the storyline is. And uh, and they're voting. It's on blockchain. They can see. Um, and uh, and that's a. And then we produced it as a as a comic, and it's official canon, DC canon. So. We're starting there, and uh, you know, at, at bringing some of our fans into uh, into story creation. A giant D and D game. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Look, I think like one one thing I like to say is Web three rewards those who show up, and uh, and rewards those who participate. And that's one of the things that, that we're really excited to try out new models for in media uh, with the Now Pass we just announced. Um, one of those things is being able to participate in community curated content initiatives. So we have a series uh, at NFT Now called Next Up, uh, where in our current model, uh, each month, myself and, and our editorial team meet and and select five rising artists that we think are great, and we put them, you know, uh, in this feature, and we celebrate them, and I, I kind of use that platform to uplift artistry. Uh, in, in our next phase, that is going to be all done via TCR, on-chain voting, uh, with our community empowered to put forward artists and, and, and vote and be able to like have a say in who gets recognized and have a say in what gets covered within some of these other content series. I think that's really powerful. Um, when we think about like Web2 Media, Web2 Media was a one-way street. It was straight from the publishers to your eyeballs. That's why your eyeballs got monetized and <laughs> that's why like they became disposable. But in we think about Web3 media, we think about tokenized media, uh, it's a much more powerful value statement where you can actually earn rewards, like we're gonna have reward mechanisms where by reading articles, by sharing articles, by contributing to what we're doing, you can actually share in the value that's being created in a much more direct way. Dave, you were nodding along there, do you want Well, I agree with it, what everyone's saying here. You know, we, it's, it's, a, it's a great opportunity, like I, you know, I, I, grind, I was grinding it out trying to sell television shows and write movies and things like that, and then my career took off you know, in, in, in the early 2000s. And, um, and I've always tried to help young writers and producers come into Hollywood because I felt like that was my opportunity to give back. And, and, and that's what the foundation of Web3 is all about, and that's what I get jazzed about as a, as a creative. You know, we have a, a new project that we're going to launch next month called Corrupted, and it's in the digital... I know the buzzword fidgetal, I'll just say it, the fidgetal wearable space. Um, but these are corrupted bots, and they're, there's a really cool tech that we spent the last year working on. Um, but it's built around a creator community where fans can come in and, and submit ideas, or artists and creators can come in and get their work done on, on these amazing collaborations that we've got going on. And, and, and we built the entire project around that. And that's what I think we're all saying here. Now, you know, Josh is right. Like, man, you would never get an opportunity to take a property like Batman and, and start fucking with that. I mean, <laughs> that's like, that's unbelievable of an opportunity. And that's the exciting part. And that's, and we're just getting started on this. And that's the, that is the, the thing that for anyone looking to break in, the, ba the barrier is so low where it's just not in traditional media. It's hard, and there's almost just a gate you can't get past. Do you think we're ever going to see a completely decentralized creative process, or is there always going to be need for some sort of centralized vetting of the, of the project, some creative voice at the heart of it? 
I mean, it's Web3, so I, I, I'm sure it will, we'll see it in some way, shape, or form. Um, I doubt it will start with a big studio. <laughs> yeah, I, I think there are a, a lot of rights issues that, are, that people probably, unless you're in this space, don't understand. Um, and, and I would encourage everybody who wants to get in to, to, to learn a little bit about it. Um, so you can go and present your ideas and concepts if that's what they're looking to do and, and have a good foundation. You know, there are rights that the studios have and there are rights that networks have and then there's actors and music rights and all that kind of stuff when you're taking these well-known properties. And it's very challenging sometimes to maneuver around them. But, but there is opportunity to find the way in. I, I think what you're going to see is, and we are seeing it now, is you know we're gonna we're gonna do a formal announcement with uh, with a project in, a, in another month or two with Barry Sonnenfeld, who's a director of um, you know the Adams Family and Men in Black, all that stuff, and he created an original franchise which started out as a graphic novel 12 years ago. Could not sell it as a traditional Hollywood film for lots of reasons. So we saw it, loved it and created now the Web3 component to that and building a Web3 game around it in an amazing way, it's sick. And, and then the hope is that we'll take it back after it becomes a Web3 project and knock on Warner Brothers' door and say, all right, we've got all of Web3 involved in this project, the amazing fan base that's in it, now let's turn it into a Hollywood movie. So it's gonna reverse engineer it in a way. And you're seeing that with a lot of projects out there. Yeah, I also wanted to say that's also what's amazing about native brands within our space is that we are not just using the same rails of rights that a lot of, a lot of other traditional IPs are using. We're creating our own rails. So uh, at Cyber Brokers and a lot of other projects, we give our users full copyright opportunities. So you could go take your Cyber Broker, put it in TV series, make millions of dollars, and that's your right. We don't take a cut of it. Um, and we have a lot of things that we don't have time to talk about of why that's important and why that actually makes your brand a lot bigger. But we are recreating those rails and trying new things um, each time, which I think is really that's exciting. Super, about, super cool. Yeah, super cool. Brands. I can see the red numbers ticking down quite rapidly there. So um, I'm going to go to my closing question, which was, in one sentence, what do you guys hope that 2023 holds for the face of NFT entertainment? Kick-ass innovation. Josie stole my answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think uh, build, build, build. Like, that's what we want to see. Uh, digital ownership, like being able to turn fans into shareholders, being able to turn uh, advocates into ambassadors. Like, I think that that's an incredibly powerful thing and that, that, that only like in Web3 can we truly tap into that in a way that we haven't seen before. And I hope that 2023 brings in the, the, pe the general audience, the masses, so they can have a real understanding of how exciting and, and game-changing blockchain technology really is and what it could do and, and that there are great creators and great projects involved and don't be scared. It is, it is new and there's a lot of negative press out there, but ignore the noise and understand that there's some great shit that's happening with a lot of great people with the panel and get people who would not normally be in this space yet in. So the future is bright for NFTs then? I, sh I sure Very don't bright. think so. Oh yeah. Man, I banked a 25 year career and I better be. <laughs> Guys, thank you very much for your time. Thanks thank a lot, you. guys. Thanks thank for you, everybody. <laughs>